uh open the meeting at 6 3 p.m hang on, hang on i'm going as fast as i can here to get this recording yeah. started i gotta stream it on one computer here that's why whenever i'm turning this way i'm dealing with the streaming computer <laughs> i gotta stream it there go here you know and i don't even get an it siphoned all right we are good to go all righty open the meeting at 6 3 First order of business is to approve and appro review and approve minutes from December 15th, 2020. No, they were great. Look them over. Yeah, they are great. All right. Is that a motion, Phil? Yes. All right. So moved. Can I have a second? Second. All righty. Roll call vote. Uh, Phil? Yes. Michael? Yes. Denise? Yes. And I vote yes also, so it's unanimous. And we are on to financial statements. I think Ashley just joined, just so you know. Oh, great. Hi, Ashley. Hi. Okay, so I emailed you out the financial report. Um, there's not too much of an update this month outside of the ordinary things. So five warrants were reviewed and signed electronically, totaling uh, $36,903.16. Um, I did also share the general fund expense reports with you, so I'm happy to take questions if you have any questions about particular expense lines. Um, but there's no concerns at this point. Uh, Kristen and I actually just had a conversation today about how some account lines really would typically be spent down by now, and um, we are seeing where we have some savings given the circumstances of the school year. So we're monitoring account lines, um, but again, happy to take questions if anyone has them. Oops. Okay. Um, the two so, other things. I, I, just a couple. I, I did note. Um, I did note this. That there was a couple of line items for salary uh, that seemed to be zeroed out for the year. That uh, for professional salaries, like curriculum and whatnot. So. I, I, um, yeah. So uh, we're we're testing out a few different things with payroll at the elementary schools this year, which sort of gives you a little bit of, of a false report on some of the salary lines. Um, you should see all administrative salaries at zero because we've encumbered the funds for the year for say my salary, Darius's salary, um, curriculum director, that kind of thing. And so we've done a PO and then every time we do payroll, the year to date number changes because we post the payroll. Um, the teachers you actually won't see posted yet because we're trying to get that processed through the database. So just sort of some testing things that I'm doing to try to get payroll to run a little bit more smoothly and efficient and to automatically generate some reports that we can then send to the town. Whereas right now, um, Brenda Antes, she's our payroll specialist. She has to manually do payroll for Conway and all of our elementary schools. And so then Jan gets, um, Excel spreadsheets and you know, there's just room for error and I'd really like to be using the database more. So that's why that stuff looks a little bit funny. Um, so two other things to update you on school lunch. I've been giving you a month to month update. Um, we're currently at a positive balance of just over $3,000 in that account. Our net income for the year. So our revenue is not, um, exceeding our expenditure. So our net income is almost exactly the same as our current balance. Um, we're a negative about 3,100. So we had a little bit of a surplus to start the year. So that's offsetting our negative net income right now. Um, an account that we've continued to talk about and we'll talk about more as we get into FY22 budget. Um, but I have been giving you a monthly update there. And then um, just a COVID update because we have started receiving reimbursements from the town. So, so far we've seen about $13,000 back in municipal. I'm looking at Phil and laughing because I already know what's coming. Um, we've seen about 13,000 in reimbursements from the town and those would go directly back to the expense lines that we prepaid them from, which is primarily school choice. Um, and then the town has about 12,000 that they're paying directly to vendors because once 
um, the town got their money, it was easier for them to sort of manage the payment rather than us pay it and then wait for funds back. So that's been nice. And then we still have some technology orders, which knock on wood, we heard that the Chromebooks are coming in this week. So we might um, actually think they're shipping tomorrow. So we'll see them hopefully next week. So we'll get the rest of that cleared up. And um, before Phil says anything, um, I have been in communication with Tom about the potential for additional funding from Municipal Cares Act. So he had said he wanted to sort of get through the first round of um, reporting for the last quarter and see where everything was at, but that he did anticipate there would be additional funding to support the schools. So Kristen and I have had a discussion already about some other possible needs. Um, and then, you know, Darius and I have sort of started talking about, and Phil, I think you brought this up a couple of times. Um, is there any way for those funds to help offset some of the deficits that we have? And, you know, I'm continuing to get the answer of no, 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 you can't do that. This isn't to supplement um, revenue loss. And so we'll continue to talk about that and, and complain and hopefully they'll start to change some things. Um, but, you know, I do think we'll see a little bit more COVID money coming in and, and Kristen does have some good ideas. So that'll be helpful. That's all I have for now. And then we'll talk about budget in a little bit. Okay. Phil, does that satisfy whatever you were antsy about? Well, I mean, we can talk about it during the budget too, because that's really what it, what, you know, for, I mean, I just, just to explain to, um, my friends and colleagues here. What, so the CARES Act is the amounts that the towns all across the country were given for COVID expenses in the very first COVID, whatever, stimulus package. Um, and originally, the original deadline for spending all that money was uh, this past December 31st. But then on December 28th or whatever, they passed a new uh, stimulus and they extended that, that deadline until this year. Uh, to, to December 31st of this year. So, and at that time, Conway still had a balance in its CARES fund of something like 80,000 something dollars. And we have had, we've been blessed in that, that we've, that our, our emergency services have spent very little of it, um, you know, versus like, so, so Deerfield on the other hand, they, you know, they spend all of their CARES Act money. And I mean, they they, they kind of had to. They had first responders that had to be quarantined in hotels and things like that. And so we haven't had anything like that. Actually, our our ambulance in town has has not yet um, transported a COVID patient. Um, so so the, I get what I'm saying is that there's this money sitting there, and if you don't spend it, you return it to the federal government. And so. I'm I, I'm just really trying to get focused on spending that money and not returning it to the federal government, and especially in like if it, it can offset um, assessment increases, that would be even like more beautiful. But it complicates things for spending it in the frontier part of it because uh, our fellow towns can't participate. What you know, um, we 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 do a we, we split expenses based on our regional uh, population, student population formula, et cetera. So we can't split expenses if one of the towns, it, you know, it, it complicates things is what I'm trying to say. So, well, but I'm sure um, the school has, you know, extra cleaning costs and PPE and all of that, which have to be significant that we should be able to use that for. And I, you know, and if, if the school doesn't, use it a lot of it's going to get i mean we were prepared to be spent we were going to be sending back 80 for something thousand dollars we will use it yeah and so, so that's the thing and it if and it, it you know and, and especially if we can use it to offset assessments that's killing two birds or not that's a bad phrase but um that's <laughs> that you know that, that that that's um that's a good thing so, even the hvac cleaning right did you guys clean your hvac system yeah. yeah, so yeah. the we've spent about 55000 I think that's around what it's going to come out to so far that the town will have contributed. A lot of that has been PPE, um, HVAC, and then a good chunk of it, probably at least 20000 is technology to get more Chromebooks and laptops and devices for teachers. 
Um, last we did an order of PPE, I want to say in late November, early December, when we when we thought the original deadline was December 31st, we were at a point where Meg um, Birch, our nurse leader, was sort of saying, we don't need any more PPE right now. We're in good shape across the district. Um, and so those pieces, I feel like we've done a really good job of planning and spending the money in a positive way. Um, and then the technology, I, you know, Kristen, I'm sure can come up with some things, but again, they're supposed to be COVID related, but I know our IT director really did the best he could to get everything we possibly could get for one-to-one -one devices and then um, teacher support for classrooms. Uh, so I think right now there's two things we're looking at. Kristen's trying to look ahead to the spring. Uh, to see what other outdoor learning types of things can we get. And even, you know, before the spring, like can we put heaters outside and that kind of thing. Um, and then also the other thing is what Phil's talking about. Is there any way to offset some of the hardship that we're going to face at the grammar school and at Frontier where Conway is impacted? And, you know, that's the big challenge, I think, right now is the answers that we keep getting are no, you can't do that. Um, so hopefully they're going to flip that switch if they continue to hear enough complaining from us. Um, but the I know, I know the tent rentals too, right? Yeah. Yep. And we have we tents have, right now. We have tents up still. Yeah. People are using them. So that's all. So that's the mission set before you spend that money. Yeah, definitely. So, um, is. I would just think cleaning expenses alone would would drive the budget right up. So anyway, um, all righty, on to we all signed the warrants. So. I'll just pause to a moment to note for, to note that it was just a little bit fun just to spend money that's not from the town from the tax. It's true. It's little. It was just a, it was just a brief little bit of fun to even talk about that. Yeah, sort of fun and not real, yeah. but you know, kind of right. Like this, um, public comment. I know there was something sent in. I don't know that I have a copy of that. That was from. I can pull. All right. Um, I also have it in front of me, Elaine. All right. Somebody want to read it? Yeah. I'm just looking. I had it. Where'd it go? <laughs> there it is. Okay. No, uh, wait. SES public comment, that's for us as well? Yeah. Oh, yeah, and the comment. There it is. Okay. Uh, this is from the FRSU 38 Special Education um, Parent Advisory Council, the CPAC, dated January 10, 2021. The FRSU 38 CPAC would like to thank the members of this committee for their ongoing support of special education students. We hope that you will continue to give special education and other vulnerable learners the option to access in-person instruction, regardless of what model is used for the rest of the school community. Thank you for your time. Holly Johnson, co-chair, Aja Cerrone, co-chair, Carrie Thurlow, secretary, and Crystal Brown, treasurer. Great. They are always updating us, aren't they? But good to notice. Um, all righty, on to unfinished business. Do we have an anti-racism and equity committee update? No, we do not this time. Um, still on the, you know, we, I kept it on the agenda, but the time coming out of vacation, they didn't have any new yeah. updates at that point. So they'll, they'll be here in February to tell us what's going on this month. All righty. And a COVID-19 update. Um, I guess the, 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 Kind of the last, you're the last group to go out of this in this cycle. Um, the COVID, you know, obviously we've been we've been back this week. Um, our antigen testing is up and running. Um, we've been trying to get that going, and we did start that up on Monday. Um, our dist, our school, how we did have to do a couple of antigen testing this week. Um, you know, for sick kiddos going home, and we were able to clear them on the way out the door, which is it must be um, it must be nice for parents. Um, the other. Uh, Update is that Shelly and I are looking into, I guess I drag you into it, Shelly. <laughs> I'm looking into, or Shelly and I are looking into, um, the pool testing has been released by, by DESI um, in a six-week trial period 
where they are going to pay for pool testing. And so what pool testing basically is, and I'll give it the, the way I give it, it's kind of, um, maybe comrades will like it, but basically you spit in the bucket and you test the bucket. Okay, but they're really doing the swab testing and they put the swabs into one thing and they test, the, they test so they'll be able to test cohorts and you get to choose your cohorts. So we could do something like the entire first grade is test at a group, they test that, they test that grouping and then you know if you have a COVID case in your classroom. Um, and you do it, you know, you have a, it's done over 48 hours. So if we do it on Monday, we'll know by the end of the day on Tuesday. And then if you get a positive test, you can use the antigen testing that we already have to figure out who in the class has COVID, if anyone. You know, I mean, obviously, if we were to be doing this all year, we wouldn't have a positive case. We haven't had a positive case in the school yet. So, um, or maybe you had somebody that you technically, because of our safety standards, you could have somebody be positive, be in the classroom, get through COVID, and no one ever knew because they didn't pass it or pass it around. So um, that's quite possible too. So basically what the state does, they set this up for six weeks. We had, we had applied, they gave us a really short window. They let us know last Friday about it. And then they said you had all, there was an information session on Tuesday. If you're interested, you had to apply by Thursday. So, you know, we submitted that we were interested because anything for free, like, you know, as Bill would say, anything for free we'll take. Um, and um, so that's basically the rollout. However, after the six weeks, so what's the catch, right? So the catch is that the companies obviously aren't gonna do this for free um, and the state's not gonna pay for it forever at this point. Perhaps we can get some pressure to change that. But after the first six weeks, it comes down to $5 a test a week. So if you do the rough numbers on that based on your population, if Conway has how many students? I don't mean to, let's just say we have 150 people in, in person, that's going to cost us around $9,000 to do testing for the remainder of the year um, after that six week period. So across the district, you know, right now, and we could use the CARE Act money to pay for that probably. So that might, I think it's, it might be very easy for Conway to be able to do that. Um, across the district, we have some other schools that are in far more financial hardship and it's gonna be, and without having CARES money. So, you know, we applied for this. If we get it, we'll do the six weeks of it. And then near the six, in the six week portion, we'll start talking about if this thing, how's it going? Is it disruptive? Is it worthwhile? Meanwhile, back at the ranch, teachers hopefully will be vaccinated in that six week period. So you're actually number, you know, your numbers of that may come down and the climate may change slightly. The question will we want to be doing pool testing just for children? Um, and I've kind of said this to people right now, it's kind of foggy about what happens after teachers are vaccinated because students aren't. Um, you know, and there's no vaccination for children um, on any horizon for this, at least this school year that I know of. Well, down to 16. Down to the age of 16. Right. Right. So, so you're high school. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but for, for, you know, Conway Grammar School speaking. So, yeah. We, you know, we don't know where, how that's going to change when teachers get vaccinated, how that's going to change the classrooms, how that's going to change. I mean, I mean, we're prepared to kind of finish the year in the, in the setup we're in. Um, but, you know, what's going to be allowed, what's not going to be allowed, that kind of stuff. And so it's kind of, to me, I, when I say my planning, I call it, there's kind of like this gray fog at that point, because there's no, they're not telling us what they're going to do. Is it children or children going to be basically herd mentality? Or, you know, are we going to continue with, you know, this or should we be doing pool testing? So those are the things we're going to have to figure out over the next, our next challenge. We keep on getting these new fun challenges. So that'll be one of our next challenges to figure out how do we plan through that? Because there is no path set and we haven't been given guidance from above. Because <laughs> I don't want to call Desi above us. So let's just say that kind of guidance. Um, but, um, you know, we don't really know how um, how, to, how it's going to figure um, go out as well. So you know, it'll be kind of real time decision making. And then obviously we have to come back to you um, in regards to if we're gonna find $10,000 and how we're gonna do that, it's gonna have to be a school committee decision um, moving forward. So that's kind of any questions on pool testing or that kind I of think thing? there's a vaccine in the pipeline for kids. I heard they started the trials, but as you, yeah. as most children vaccinations are, they do them far longer trials and, yeah. you know, and given, I would say also given the, fact that the effects of COVID on children is so low, much lower, there's no, the rush 
is going to probably be reduced in the sense of if, if they had the same kind of issue older adults are having with it, you'd probably see them rushing it along faster. But the risk reward, right? Yeah. I just got my second vaccine Tuesday. So, so did you get sick afterwards? Uh, no, I got. Do you mind telling us about your medical history, I, I, please? Uh, no, I uh, my arm wasn't even sore. I was very tired yesterday, um, but no, some people had some mild body aches or fatigue is the biggest one. And it basically was lasted like from late yesterday until this morning and was gone. So, but. So, you working, has there, you're working too hard. Yeah. <laughs> Has there, has there been a for you? Has there been like a reduction in just sort of the normal daily micro panics that come to everybody in this pandemic? Just when your mask slips below your nose and this and that, and just is there is there just like a little bit less of a, a of a fear factor? I think definitely, and uh, what well, although I got to give it two weeks to be fully fully on board. They say two weeks after the second dose, but yes, I feel a little more invincible definitely than I did. Cause you know, one minute you live in sort of oblivion and the next minute you're like, Oh my God, I went in the grocery store. I'm going to have it. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. yeah I do know what you mean. Yeah. Wait, do you feel a little bit better than all of us? <laughs> I feel a little bit better. <laughs> I do. <laughs> I think it's going to be, everybody's going to have it soon i mean they i mean it's just sort of stacked up ready to roll like let's get get it rolling you know i only lucked out because uh river my counseling center is part of maholyoke hospital which is a small hospital and they got enough for all of us so you know i have a friend at cooley that you know still hadn't gotten it after i had my second she does direct client care so because they're part of mgh so it's got to trickle down takes looks it's, it's a little longer to trickle down but yeah. no, administrators have to get it first <laughs> i know I, actually right, funny jokes. I'm sorry. I was like oh I, I i you know kept waiting and waiting but then they're like okay anybody in in the system and i was like sign me up but definitely the people who have direct client care went first but it went really fast once we went go, got going, and I've heard of very few side effects. Good. Yeah. So, all righty. So we are on to budget proposal. That must be fun to make a COVID budget. You've been making budgets since you got here, Shelley, haven't you? <laughs> I don't think I've stopped. <laughs> I don't think you have either. <laughs> Um, so I did share with you the complete budget and then also the narrative, uh, which Darius is going to pull up on his screen for us to look at. Um, I want to start with the general announcement that this is a draft. It's our first draft. There's not been a lot of creative thinking put into this yet to how we can reduce our number because we do recognize it is an increase that's higher than where we want to be or need to be. Um, but at the same time, we wanted to give you represent, uh, representation of what the actual numbers look like right now. Um, so we started with a level service approach to generate the first draft, uh, and that included the increases per contract obligations for cost of living adjustment and our steps. Also, anyone that had um, column movement, so if they had were moving from a master's to a master's plus 30 or whatever the next column is in the contract, that's taken into consideration here. Um, and then we also built in for uh, non-union staff, such as custodians, uh, cafeteria, central office, secretaries, the, the, that kind of personnel, um, to get a raise as well, typical cost of living adjustment. Um, and then I did look at non-salary accounts to make sure that over the past few years, if we've been really over an account, uh, looking at why we were over, um, and ad making adjustments so that moving forward, we can continue to meet our needs. Um, and then we also built in a 3.5% increase to insurance-related expenses, which really only pertains to central office expenses that Conway pays a portion of, um, because the other insurances and things are paid through the town for school employees. But there was a slight increase there. 
Um, and then the next step was to look at the revolving accounts, school choice, school lunch, early childhood, and then special education to make sure that the expenses that we have been paying from those funds could continue to be paid in the future. Um, so looking at all of those pieces, we are at a 6.29% increase right now, um, which is, we know, too high. Um, the total numbers are there for everyone to take a look at and see. Um, and then I'm gonna go ahead and explain, there are really three big factors impacting this. Um, two of them are COVID related. Uh, so our early childhood program, you know, we've been talking about this since last May. Uh, the program does not look the same that it did in the past. Uh, we have less students in the program and that means we're generating less revenue. However, our expenses have not changed. Um, so we did move 25,000 off of the early childhood revolving fund onto the general budget for next year. Uh, the second is similar theme here, school lunch. Um, we are bringing in some revenue from state and federal reimbursement for meals served. However, it's not our typical revenue stream, um, but again, expenses have not changed. So I anticipate by the end of FY21, we're gonna have to move some expenditures, including wages onto this year's general fund. Uh, which I do believe we have savings to cover, but going into next year, you know, I know we've had this conversation about Conway's school lunch programming program, um, either running in a deficit year to year, or that we don't necessarily believe that the program should have um, funding to fund itself. But I think we're going to be in a really difficult position next year because we're talking about thirty-five thousand dollars worth of wages that we won't have revenue to cover. Um, you know, obviously, if circumstances change and we can increase enrollment in the preschool program or if lunch can go back to some normalcy, you know, we can move these changes back onto those revolving funds once we know more. And I do expect that the timeline for the budget process never fails every time I'm talking. Um, the timeline for the budget process, I think, is going to be much longer. I think we all know that and that town meetings are going to get pushed. So we have some time to work through some of these challenges. But again, I thought it was best for us to look at the real numbers right now. Um, so those two pieces come out to about 3%. Uh, almost 20,000 is 1% increase. Uh, so those pieces alone, um, we're looking at about 3% increase of our 6.29. Then the last piece is also something that we talk about in years that it comes up. Uh, we do have a teacher who's retiring and the retirement benefit we do anticipate to be between 18 and 20,000. Um, so I did add that back in. It's an expense that we did not have in 21 because we didn't have anyone retiring. So, you know, this is one of those things that we talk about should there be money there as a placeholder or shouldn't there be money there as a placeholder every year because when we have an instance like this where we have to pay out, um, it's a quick 1% increase for one staff member. So, you know, that's what we're looking at there. So between those three pieces, um, if we could not have those issues right now, we'd be under a 3% increase, which is really a good spot for us to be in. Um, and then I'm just telling you here, one minor increase to non-salary um, expenditures, which is $4,500. We've consistently been over in some of our network technology software lines every single year. So I think it's best to sort of write that account. It's actually a couple of different accounts, but they're all related to the same thing. You know, and let's make sure that we're truly budgeting for what our expenses are. But it's such a minor increase that it doesn't have a big impact, but it's one of the more significant non-salary changes. Um, so I know I've given you a lot of information. Um, I'm happy to take questions. And, you know, definitely as we continue to go through this process, you know, for February, we'll be looking at hopefully having some more information, maybe even um, the governor's first proposal of the budget and, you know, talking more closely about how we bring that number down and how we get through some of these challenges um, and have a hopefully a smaller number for you next time. But I'm happy to take questions. Or comments. So the one retirement is a one percent difference in the budget. That's correct. Wow! Can you imagine if we had two or three? It, but the irony, the irony, Elaine, is how 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 much we tried to, you know, deal with this through 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 you know negotiations and and I guess we're on year what is this year eighteen year nineteen, 
right? It counting the, the clock is counting, but um, but, we're, but those the, you know the, the, how many more generations of school committees are still going to have to explain this budget line item at town meeting? You know, um, but yeah, we did our best. We'll see see what we can do next time. But right. it's interesting that we how much time we put into this this specific issue, and then here right. it is right away. And I don't forget, you know, the person, the person that's do that is do every penny of it, in my opinion. I don't begrudge that person uh, uh, anything, but just the way that we do it, the the whole lump sum concept is uh, is is rough. Mm -hmm. uh, Who's retiring? Um, our occupational therapist, Mary Gilman. Oh, okay. All righty. Any more questions about the budget? And we appreciate it. It's a a draft because a lot's going to go on in the next few months. I have no doubt. So um, but between Shelly, between now and next month, that we're supposed to get the governor's numbers, and it's supposed to firm up a little. I mean, I, I talked to um, Natalie Blay not long ago, our, our state representative, and. Um, you know, although she might not be Conway's, is she? Yes, she is. Oh, she yes. is. Okay. Yeah. Um, yes. You know, and she said they've been in session about a lot of things, but budget is certainly not one of them. You know, they've got to get through the inauguration and see what's going to happen there. So, you know, I, yeah. she also said he has a, it's in the constitution that there's a date that the governor's supposed to have the budget out by, but, yeah. you know, January all timelines are messed January up. He says he's going to meet it, though. He's the one that kicks off the process by putting out the cherry sheets and the whatever and the, his numbers. So I don't know. Yeah. Ray, I mean, I think the big thing is they're trying to see what's coming from the federal government. You know, what is going to be the stimulus package to the states and then how to react off of that. And even if he puts out numbers, you know, the House is not going to jump on it right away anyway. So I, I imagine it, it will be a while before we see anything real. <laughs> And I said this to the other school committees, we we want this process to take longer because the, uh, the all the unknowns that we just talked about even earlier with COVID and what school looks like next year and that kind of stuff, um, you know, and we've, you know, we're in communications with the town regarding this, as Phil's here. Um, but basically, the you know, we, we don't want to wrap this thing up quick, quickly because we want to see what the what the, the model is going to be like in September and how where is, what is COVID or maybe it's gone. Maybe everything's, you know, the sun is shining or maybe we have some other expenses and that kind of stuff because all those revolving funds we, we are going to be based on that. And so we won't, you know, have a better idea if we're going to get income or not. So I'm just saying that it's a, it's a, it's a patient budget season. That's why we really want to show a really transparent. This is where we're starting with all the, we didn't try to fix those numbers yet because how we fix them is going to depend on how we get revenues as a town and as a state and yada yada. Have there been layoffs? Or is like gym happening and music happening or have those people been laid off? That's all happening. It's happening. Oh, wow. Yeah. Mrs. M actually, uh, Ar Arlene had the all of her classes out for a nice hike today for phys ed. Yeah. Which was really, um, really great. But yeah, they're all happening. Okay. Yeah, we have not done any layoffs, furloughs, cuts. You know, we, we really haven't even started to talk about any of that yet. Um, obviously, it's not something that we want to do unless we have to. Um, I think the only group of individuals impacted right now are the school lunch staff, because when we are remote, they're obviously not serving lunch unless it's a pickup day. So their hours have been reduced, which is different than last spring when um, COVID first was around, we paid everybody, um, which was a, you know, the right decision at that time, but we just can't continue to do that without the revenues coming in. So they're the only ones that have had some reduced hours. What about uh, people with clubs and stuff like that? All those, you know, stipends that people get for after school stuff. After school is not taking place. So all those should be savings, right? Does that get well, that must get budgeted? Most of that is paid if it's after school programming, it's paid directly from the after school revenue. Okay. 
what about coaching and all you know all those drama club all those kind of things oh by frontier everywhere yeah so um some of them have been reduced some of them have been canceled and some of them are trying to happen so from coaching depending if the sports happened um the fall you know i'm not to go into a long deal but fall sports for example the ones that didn't take place the coaches did all the teams did try to do some things so we paid them a portion of their stipend um in, in doing that kind of stuff the you know drama club and that kind of thing they're trying to do a digital based one so the you know they gotta they have to continue to meet the 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 what they're trying to do with these kids and then report that to the principal. But there are some that are canceled and there's some that are they're trying to do. Virtually. Yeah, I'm excited. Okay. The Frontier is actually trying to, you know, have the ski club. So it's great for the kids and with transportation. So that's nice for them to get out. Less screen time. From a parent's perspective here at the elementary school, like PE and art have, have been highlights both in person and when we're remote, um, you know, I, I can see my kids running around the house, you know, as a scavenger hunt to get exercise on a remote day, whereas otherwise they'd just be sitting there still in a quieter class. It's so great to have them get that time to get up and get moving in a social interaction with other kids, even though they're at home. So I, I think it's been a really valuable component um, this year. So, I have a question about vaccines. So I know the teachers are kind of pegged for February. Are they required to get the vaccine? And does that mm -hmm. impact the teachers that are now at home working? Are they going to be coming back to school? Those How does that work? Those are sure open that hornet's nest, Denise. It's always the quiet ones that look like yeah, they're here. I haven't asked a question of you. Let me hit you with the hardest <laughs> one you've had in a couple of weeks. So, what's funny is we, we just we had, had negotiations today with 38, and um and we we talked about that brief. We just kind of talked about that as an issue that we're gonna have to tackle because it's right around the corner. It is, it's gonna come around the corner, and there is um I attended a, you know, a legal seminar where they talked about there is a couple cases sitting in, in the in the in the uh, was it superior court or whatever court regarding unions and requirements of vaccination. I think it's a police union that is the is the is the one that's part of the of that, and they're waiting for if they're going to do a hearing on it and if they will do it and if it will be timely or not. Because um, the it's flu be, vaccine you know, was a requirement, right? The flu vaccine. I think it was the flu vaccine was is what they were is the case oh. that they had. Oh, okay. Right, and so they're using that. That'd be the case law. They're waiting to hear a hearing on that for case law for whatever. So anyway, so a lot of the stuff there's a lot of unknowns on it, um, and there's also a lot of you know we talked about a little bit today in in the negotiations about we weren't negotiating it. We were just talking. Um, you know that you know what if you know what if people don't trust the vaccination. You know, what I mean, you know, is, are we as employers going to give? And remember, we can talk about this in executive session. So let's just talk about it broadly here because we don't want to do that kind of thing. But, you know, um, you know, what, you know, are we going to allow, you know, to what allowance are we going to have if people are, are still concerned or don't believe the vaccination is going to be is safe or, you know, that kind of thing? Um, and I said it's going to it's going to come to some sort of ugly head at some point as employers. We're going to, have to say you've been hired for such a position and so on and so forth. But what does that look like and what is the timing of that? Um, and then how are doctors going to react regarding notes? Because it comes down to doctor's notes and that kind of stuff. So there's a lot of loose pieces here. And I don't have the answer to what it can look like going ahead and, and what that means if we're going to require people to come back, if, um, you know, not, what the not, time frame of that is. Not to, make, not to mention religious or faith based objections. Yep, correct. And um yeah and so i mean I'd be, I'd be curious to we will probably be looking at what the other unions and are doing as well i mean you have hospital unions you have you know police unions fire unions you know those kind of stuff and what's going on there and, and we cross you know case law and that and then also what do we what do we want to do as employers in our values and that kind of stuff you know what i mean like, in balancing that out and because the question is because i said 
I mean, COVID's not going away. It's it, now it's going to be part of our uh, our database of annual flu vaccines. They, they, you know, one of the strains in there will be COVID. It'll be the year because COVID nineteen is by the year, so there'll be COVID twenty one or COVID twenty two or COVID twenty three. This is what we think, and so we need the future years that the same type of thing is going to be out there. And so whatever we do, we're going to have to be planning long term and that kind of stuff. So yeah, it's a it's an excellent question. These where there's no answer on that yet. But again, another one of those, you know, how do we affect this year versus next year? You know, um, yeah. Good stump the stump the superintendent. That like let's it. play stump the superintendent. Exactly, that's easy to do. <laughs> <laughs> But the, the the Denise the the four town boards of health did put out a memorandum I think two days ago laying out their the anticipated vaccine rollout in our county and for our four towns and they anticipate oh. April for, for general public which is where I fit in so I so the bottom of the line should start to get moving in April they say well the state side is saying February for teachers but I don't know what right. that means for our yeah, area. Yeah, yeah. They're they're head, they're head of school committee members. We just we just need them to give Franklin County the doses because I really, in talking with Carolyn Ness in the county, the county's ready to go. It's I a know. question of getting them to yeah. inject, you know. Yeah. And so if they just say, hey, listen, let's divide it up. If you know anybody? Just give us our give us our county doses. We'll take it from there. Thanks. Did you, you hear know? Alaska is like the most vaccinated state right now? Because they did like they and they were they're taking them out by snowmobile and sled and but they they were like ready to hit the ground running and ran. I mean, it's yeah. I don't understand why we don't have just huge tents set up and people are getting vaccinated. I guess we don't have enough people. Is that the to give the vaccines? Well, next week to let stadiums opening up. I heard for, that. Yeah for first responders and then they, they anticipate to keep it rolling. So mm. it, I think it's going to go fast once it gets rolling. But can you imagine the politics in like a city of Worcester about, you know, which, which, you know, first responder group gets it first. How do you do first responder groups and just the politics and the unions and the, I mean, just in the infighting and the under, under desk deals and, you know what I mean? Like you could just, you know, I don't know. See, what uh, they're know. starting to say now just, is like, forget this. Like there's so much vaccine waiting, this tier thing, you know, yes, you want to get certain people oh, first, really? but we have so much waiting. Like, let's just get it to who wants it, you know? So we'll see what happens with that. But ship it to our door, nurse will inject us. And that division's already taken place a little bit just with the first responders in there. I mean, Con Conway's, you know, police, fire, uh, EMS are just getting there there's now this week last week and next week and there's other town yeah yeah other towns have gotten it before our town no it, ha it has been duly noted alphabetically mm -hmm. yeah i guess so if you've had covid you're supposed to wait three months i think it is so you got to keep that in mind if oh. you've been positive so if you, don't really, if you had it you don't really need it right you know uh, you want it, but you you do have immunity for a period of time. I forget what time they're saying now, but not forever. Yeah. But anyway. Excellent. All righty. So we're on to gifting student specific equipment to students' new school. That's a mouthful. Mm -hmm. Kristen, are you talking about this or do you want me to chime in? Or we Sorry, can talk I'm sorry, I'm going between screens. Um, oh, um, I don't mind, Shell. Um, we had a student um, who left Conway Grammar School and went to another school. And there is a specific piece of equipment that the student needed needs that we purchased six or seven years ago. Um, the school has asked if if the piece of equipment could go with the student um you know we talked about could the school purchase it we were going to ask for that but it's really of no street value whatsoever it's just so we were wondering if the school committee would allow conway grammar school to gift the piece of equipment 
to the to go with the child to the to the school. It's a gift to the child, or is it a gift to the school? Well, I, um, I'm I am hoping we can write it in a way that it's a gift to the child in case the child comes back to back to the district. Sounds good. Sounds good. Shelly, what do you think about that? Sorry, Shelly, I didn't talk to you about that. Before. No, I think that's fine. Do we need a vote? Yes, we need yeah. a vote. All right, so moved. Second. Uh, roll call, Phil? Yes. Michael? Yes. Denise? Yes. Ashley? Yes. And I, me, I'm a yes also. All righty. So you'll look it's, into whether it can go directly to the kid. Yeah, it's it's a law. If people are wondering what the heck we're doing here, like it makes sense. If it has no real value, why don't we just give it? But we can't give away public material without you voting that. So yeah. in case someone's scratching your head at home. Yeah. <clears throat> All righty, we're on to reports. Uh, I do not have a report. Uh, Superintendent, we got your report. Do you want to tell us about it? Um, just a couple quick ones. Um, I want to welcome uh, Jeffrey McDonald is our new food service director. He's coming up us from UMass um, Food Service. And he did able to work a week before break um, with Mary to get some coverage there, uh, some training and that kind of stuff. And so um, he's, doing, he's hitting the ground running and doing a fine job. So we're excited to have him aboard. Um, I do want to mention that, Kristen, you talking about MCAS. Was that on your report? Yeah, you get that. But you go right ahead, Darius. Yeah. No, nope, that's all I got. Well, the food at UMass I heard was good, so that should be good, right? There you go. So I have a thing I was going to talk about MCAS, but I don't let Kristen do it. Okay. Because I got to do it four other times. Okay. Well, and DA gave us $25,000. That was nice. No, they didn't. No, they didn't. <laughs> oh, they, they did. Gave it to, they gave it that to Frontier and Deerfield. Oh, okay. I was all excited. <laughs> all right. Well, it still benefits our kids. So, all righty. On to you, Kristen. Oh, you're muted. I'm going to mute, though. couple quick okay. things. We have uh, completed the installation of the ultraviolet lighting through the HVAC system air handlers. So, that, that was great. Um, we, we, uh, our lease was up for our copiers and printers. So, um, we just last week received new copiers and printers, um, which we feel like it's going to be a cost savings because we have a whole contract and, and, you know, repairs and all of that will be taken care of within this contract. So we're excited about that. And then MCAS update, um, which is this year, all students well students in, in grades three through eight we'll be taking a shortened MCAS. Um, it'll be a shortened time and um, they'll take a portion of each MCAS test. Um, so I'm stumbling on my words, isn't it? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Very tired today. Um, the uh, accountability will not, we will, oh my goodness, dear, let me start over again. I'm so sorry. <laughs> Short MCAS time for grades three to eight. The department will significantly reduce the testing time for the students through a session sampling approach in which each student will take only a portion of each MCAS assessment in each subject. This modified MCAS administration will preserve the validity and reliability of the test at the school, district, and state levels. When combined with other data points, this approach will provide meaningful diagnostic data at the individual student level. Accountability relief will be given. The commissioner will not name or recommend to the board any new underperforming or chronically underperforming districts or schools in the upcoming school year. Um, so we appreciate the MCAS data points and, uh, and you know, we will make it as least stressful as we can for the children. The children will have to be in person to take the MCAS, but we have 100% um, in-person students in grades three, four, five, and six. So we, we don't have a worry about in that in terms of kids who are remote. And um, 
uh, most of our students are back four days a week. Our last um, group, which will be the fifth grade, it's the biggest, will be coming back February 1st. And at that point, all of our students will be back four days a week. And it's going very well. We, we have really tight, 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 tight protocols with cohorts and masking and and um, hand washing and um, um, yeah, masking. Yeah, so we're, we're doing well. Um, I think in general, people are nervous about the pandemic, but um, I'm feeling that like things are going very well. Kids yes. are so happy to be in school. I can't say Your that. Your kids are going to be ahead of most of them, I think, because they've been able to be in so our kids. That's yeah, great. yeah I, could, I could give like a applause to Kristen and Darius and the whole administrative team that has pulled off managing the hybrid model um that's you know, the community as a you know uh, a large percentage of the community was desirous of it and made it happen so thank you never mind our families that can actually then like work when their kids are in school without trying to juggle tasks that's amazing right. amazing yeah. gift. <laughs> Kristen, do you anticipate more from... busing needs? What'd you say? All right, do you anticipate more busing needs now that the kids are starting to all go back every day? No, I've reached, out, I've reached out to several parents. A funny thing has happened. I've reached out to several parents, um, most of the busers, and many of the kids are enjoying their parents bringing yeah, them. Yeah, they do. <laughs> I'm included. I'm sorry, Denise. I'm so sorry. I'm riding the bus, though. So sorry. <laughs> Pretty we, good week. <laughs> We've picked up more kids on the buses, though, as we've gone along, but we've got we've got more space. Okay. Um, so, yeah. Why is Frontier? So, no. are the other schools following suit in terms of kids going back, like for four days, or all the schools are different? The schools are different. So, um, it's interesting. Well, it has to do with each school has its own problems with each with every model, and so. Um, you know, they right now at the middle school, they, they're still only at it two days a week. Um, in high school, two days a week. They're looking to expand that, but yeah. now it's about to change over semester. So they're not going to change a week before semester ends and then, you know, final exams. That kind of so they're going to look to do that in the following semester um, to do increase. Um, it also has to do with spacing and class sizes. They're different because they're the way schedulings are working for the secondary. Um, the other elementaries are also increasing time. Deerfield's at four days a week. Um, they started at a Monday. Uh, Waitley is doing a transition in uh, four days a week. I think they'll be full four days a week next week of all their grades. I think some of their, I'm not just I think, I know their younger grades started this week. They started doing two tr transition period where they brought a couple of classes back for four days and then the following week bring the rest back. Um, and then Sunderland is still, it's still at two days a week, but they have their uh, uh, vulnerable learners, which is a, it's a, it's a much larger number than, um, which is over 50, that are in four days a week. So it's kind of a mixed model because the amount of vulnerable learners that they've kind of done it that way. So it's a little bit different in each building. It was also, we approached the, that second phase by working with the staffs in each building. And, and you know, this is how, you know, working together, how we can do it and kind of rolling it out. Um, it, it's, it's been successful. I mean, it was, it was a lot of negotiation, not like heavy negotiation, but negotiation with individuals and making people feel comfortable and that kind of stuff. And um, I'm, I'm pleased. I'm, and I know when Michael just made that compliment to us, I also want to, it goes right down. It goes all the way through, all the way to our teachers, to our instructional assistants and everybody else who works in our schools because um, we're up and running, you know, and I'm going to knock on wood because I've been doing it all the time, you know, for as long as we can. Um, and we've been able to do it when our districts have not been able to. And it, it really is a, it's the, I'm not saying those aren't trying, but we, you know, we were able to take what our situation was and make it happen, so. All righty, do we have any other business? Do we need executive session? I don't think we do, do we? No, we do. We, Elaine, there is a business in the, uh, in the uh, unanticipated matters arising in the last 48 hours exception to the agenda 
and that's the um, which I've been asked to present to this full committee tonight from our town clerk, um, Lori Lucier, and actually also from the former town clerk, Jenny Knowlton, um, who both wrote an email that um, requesting requesting the use of the school gymnasium for the nonpartisan town caucus, um, on, which is which they want on Monday, March first at seven thirty p.m. Um, which for uh, for twenty five to thirty five people, and the room is rated for I forget how many two hundred something or whatever I believe. So um, that's so the, what I know. The board of health was involved in the request, and I. Um, but that but for, for legal notice purposes, they can't wait to the February meeting of the school committee. So um, they don't want to try to do it remote. Well, the thing is that it's um, that they're that what, what most most towns have dropped this 200 years ago and, and do right. it by nomination papers. But we, we actually have done this every year without fail since 1767. Mm -hmm. And so, I mean, this this it's a nonpartisan tradition that predates the Republican and the Democratic parties by 50 years. And yes, I've dragged many a person out of their home in yes. a cold February. Yes, yes. To show up to be and, one of and, the 25. Yes. And so, and Ginny, Ginny wrote a long thing about how in her 40 years as town clerk, she's only ever received nomination pep papers um, outside of the town caucus format like five or six times. That this is how you get all your candidates. And then people find out that, that nobody ran a town caucus, then they submit write in papers, or whatever. But that this is how the town functions. And um, to, to lose it would be a shame. So I, I don't really know how to handle it or how the administration and the school committee want to handle it. But I have been asked to bring it to the school committee's attention and um, and, and seek out an answer. So I, uh, I don't, I, you know, I can, Kristen, you can kind of chime in, but. Given, I mean, we're in a different world of understanding COVID than we were six months ago when we shut everything down and that kind of thing. I, I think that the building being used at night poses little to no risk to our students and faculty the following morning. Um, we've learned that COVID is, you know, not sitting on surfaces like in transmitted in that way, you know. And so basically, as long as we, you know, Kristen puts together that, you know, we, we clean that bathroom and that general area gets mopped down. I think we're going to be. I think it's we're more than. I think we're more than comfortable with allowing as long as the board of health is allowing that that level that size of gathering to occur at that time. Sounds good to me. Phil, could you please repeat the date and time? Monday, March, March first. It's like eight o'clock. It's late. Yeah, what it's seven thirty. I'm not sure what time, but it's seven thirty or eight. And tr tradition, traditionally, it lasts like less than an hour. Yeah. And then, um, you know, I know um, that maybe the, the, the so something can be worked out with extra cleaning, whatever, whatever might be next deemed advisable. I don't know, but the town can help with that. And this is what COVID, I, I don't know whether COVID could help with that. The, the COVID expenses could help with that too, probably cleaning for this. So yeah, it's not a, again, it's not a big cleaning. If you, if you really break it yeah. down, it, um yeah. bathrooms i look at the bathrooms as the only thing that has to be sanitized everything else you know a, an aerosol covid would be dead if it hit the floor by the time the next occupants hit the building so um you know we could, could have people bring their own chairs phil <laughs> yeah i guess byoc <laughs> anyway all right we'll figure that out but it sounds like it's a go all right, anything All right. else before we get a wrap? Thanks. Can I get a motion to adjourn? Sure, yes. Second. Second. All righty, do I roll call to adjourn? Uh, Phil? Yes. Denise? Yes. Yes. Michael? Yes. Ashley? Yes. All right, me too. Thank you, everybody.